Uh, good morning, uh, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Elias Grampas, and on behalf of the Secretariat of the European Parliament Intergroup on Climate Change, Biodiversity and Sustainable Development, I'm very happy uh, to welcome you to today's event, where uh, we'll be speaking a lot about oceans, uh, international ocean governance, uh, the uh, key outcomes and uh, interlinkages between uh, BBNJ and CBD. Um, this event is hosting uh, by MEP Ms. Catherine Chabot, uh, co-chair of the Working Group on Ocean Governance under the umbrella of the European Parliament Intergroup. Uh, it will be kindly moderated by Ms. Mina Epps, uh, head of the IUCN Ocean Team. So thank you very much for being with us today. And uh, concerning some uh, practical details, I'd like to let you know that uh, presentations will be made available on the website of the Intergroup at uh, ebcd.org slash intergroup. Uh, the event is also recorded, so you can find the recording at the website as of tomorrow. And uh, concerning uh, the Q&A session that will follow the um, uh, intervention of speakers, uh, I'd like to let you know that we want to have a session that is a, as interactive as possible. So please feel free to raise your hand uh, for attendees in the room and for uh, attendees connected online. We'll also make sure to take as many questions as uh, time will allow us. Uh, once again, uh, thank you very much uh, for joining us today uh, in person in the European Parliament and uh, electronically via WebEx. Uh, it's been with great pleasure uh, to see you all today. And with no further ado, I'll uh, pass the floor to Mina Epps uh, for setting the scene with regards to the discussion today. Thank you. So good mornings and greetings to all here in the room and online. It's a pleasure to be here with you. And what a moment this is in history. A historic moment was passed quite recently. Uh, many of you in the room know that on the 19th of June, the BBNJ or the High Seas Biodiversity Treaty was adopted by consensus. And this is great news for ocean governance, which have previously been fragmented. This treaty is the third internationally legally binding treaty under the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea, which solely focuses on the conservation and sustainable use of marine, uh, marine resources. So again, it's what a better time. And it also comes at the back of the recently adopted Kunming Montreal uh, Global Biodiversity Framework. So, you know, we have good wins, I would say, for the ocean and ocean governance. Uh, so this event is very, very timely. So I'd like to thank the, the inter, Intergroup for Climate Change and Biodiversity and Sustainable Development, but foremost, um, the hosting MEP, Catherine Chabot, um, which has been really delighted. And not only uh, is she... Um, uh, and I can't think of a better MEP to represent the ocean than someone who's an avid sailor, uh, who's very passionate uh, all the way through all of your cells, I would say you are an ocean passionate uh, leader. So thanks for that leadership. So I'm going to be uh, moderating this session. My name is Mina Epps. I come from the International Union for Conservation of Nature. It's an intergovernmental organization which is host by, which is comprised, uh, co co comprised, <laughs> comprised of um, 200 state agency members, but also civil society organization, including indigenous peoples organization, uh, and which our members come together every fourth year at the General Assembly to vote on motions that become resolution. So acting on biodiversity beyond national jurisdiction is very key. The IUCN is an observer um, to the United Nations General Assembly and many of these conventions. So I actually had the privilege and pleasure to, to head um, IUCN's delegation for the BBNJ treaty negotiation in New York. And with other here in the room, I had the pleasure of experiencing the UN sleepover. Um, so this has been amazing experience and also very thankful to the president um, of the IGC, but also the Bureau and Dualos for allowing civil society of all observers, including civil society, to participate. That enabled IUCN to be able to bring together and provide independent expertise, scientific and legally, to the state delegates. So it was a great honor, and we are going to hear more about it shortly in those experiences. So without further ado, really the pleasure, I'd like to hand the floor over to MEP Catherine Chabot. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mina, and uh, it's really a pleasure and an honor for us to have you here as a moderator. And uh, I'm very, very happy and uh, 
very, very impressed by our high-level panel. Uh, so uh, good, uh, good morning, everyone, and welcome, and thank you for joining in person or online. I don't know, Ilias, how many people we have uh, already online, but uh, welcome to, to everybody. And uh, I would like to also thank the teams uh, involved in the organization of this event, in particular the EBCD intergroup with Ilias, but also with Regine and of course Despina, who is, uh, who is here. And of course, um, the, my team, uh, Lola, you are here. Thank you very much for the organization. I would like to welcome the panel of high level experts we, we have with us today. And I'm delighted to hear from stakeholders in the BB, BBNG uh, negotiations, as well as a representative of the CBD, the FAO, uh, F, RFMOs, and the OSPA Convention. I would like to thank you for accepting our invitation and to thank particularly uh, you, Madam, coming from Canada uh, and uh, it's an honor for you to, for us to, to have you here. So, as you said, Nina, on the 19th of June, uh, formal adoption of the BNG uh, Treaty in New York, a result that has been uh, awaited uh, for at least 15 years, and uh, excellent news for the ocean, as you, as you said. And I think for many of us, uh, this is the, the culmination of years of hard work. And in, uh, if I may, uh, give um, a personal testimonial uh, testimony uh, about that. In in 2013, it was the, the 11th of April. Uh, I organized an international event conference on the IC governance in the in France in Paris. It was in the French CESE, Conseil Économique, Social et Environnemental, and we launched uh, a Paris appeal for the IC. And in the text, we recognize the ocean as a common good of humanity, and the steering committee was beginning uh, was the, the, the beginning of the ocean and climate platform that we, we launched one year after. So it was 10 years ago. So for us, it's a, an achievement. While adoption is not yet a signature, still less ratification, it brings us closer to implementation. As you know, a few months earlier, the Kunming Montreal uh, Agreement establishing a new global framework for the protection of biodiversity. So there is a lot going on at the moment in terms of major events for biodiversity and the ocean. And I could also speak about the nature restoration law. We are, it's an issue for us today because next week we will vote in the plenary uh, this uh, this text, <laughs> this legislation, one of the pillars of the of our uh, green deal, and uh, but it's an issue to yeah to find a lending uh, area. So um, I'm not going to go into details of our subject, as our speakers today will be able to talk about it better than I can. But uh, firstly, on the negotiation, there is a lot of questions after this adoption. Firstly, on the negotiations themselves, I, I would be very interested to, to, to hear uh, from uh, Aurore Maillet, uh, and you, you will present uh, again from the, the commission, because Aurore, you, are, uh, you have been, how do you say, the sleep? <laughs> what sleepover. is the, the sleepover? I did not know the, the what is the translation in French? The sleepover. <laughs> Very interesting. How do you how do you how do you translate in uh, French? Soirée pyjama. Uh, soirée pyjama. <laughs> okay, <laughs> okay. The sleepover. Uh, and I I salute really uh, Aura the tremendous work you you have done, and uh, we probably also will speak about the role played by EU during the these negotiations and the role of other delegations, such as the Chinese delegation. I would be interested to know whether the progress made at COP15 and the BBNG negotiations, whether the, the, the um, offers any hope for other negotiations, such as the Antarctic negotiations to create two 
NPAs uh, around the Antarctic. We, we voted a resolution on that topic here in the parliament. Also, the shadow of Russia still hangs over these negotiations. And I could uh, also speak about the ongoing negotiation at the IMO on the revision, revision of the MARPOL uh, strategy to reduce greenhouse gas emissions from the maritime transport. I was in London yesterday, uh, those two last days. And uh, I'm, very, I'm very interested to see how the, the, what will be the conclusion at the end of the, the week, because, for instance, China is not pushing for uh, an amb a big ambition on this uh, strategy. It will also be interesting to know whether the ocean now plays a more important role in the internal and external policies of states, including landlocked countries. I'm speaking about uh, the member states of the, the EU. And we, you will probably speak about the process of signing and ratifying the, the BBNG Treaty. There are also many questions for all speakers about the content of BBNG Treaty on the creation of marine protected areas on the high seas. How in practical terms will this be implemented on marine genetic resources and the sharing of benefits arising from them? The BNG Treaty has been widely acclaimed as a fair and equitable agreement enabling the, the sharing of knowledge and benefits with developing countries. Interesting to hear the, the point of view of uh, um, Madam uh, Chi Yuli, that uh, if, sorry if uh, the pronunciation is not the good one, but uh, the, you, you are the representative of, of the CBD here. What is the relation between the various existing frameworks, uh, in particular the, the, the conventions for regional seas such as OSPAR and the RFMOs? Probably a question for Mr. Campbell and Dominic Pattinson, but uh, our moderator will see. Does the treaty uh, not send a signal to RFMOs for the implementation of SDG 14 and the fight against illegal fishing, on which, for example, progress has been made uh, at the WTO with the decision to put an end to harmful subsidies? Probably question for Mr. Barange from FAO. For my part, I have one regret. The notion of the ocean as a global common of humanity or common good of humanity for which I campaigned since five years hard to have it included in the preamble of the BBNG Treaty. Uh, and we spoke, Mina, together on this topic and also with Aurore during the negotiations. For me, it's a moral notion, not only for me, for the French CNRS, uh, you know, CNRS in France, uh, Francoise Guy, and uh, the French Institut Francais de la Mer, uh, because we launched this appeal together. And uh, for us, it's not a legal, but a, a moral notion. So there would be no legal consequences to recognize such a notion. It is the idea that we share only an ocean one ocean, and that is, is therefore our global common, which should therefore be protected individually and collectively. And I, I can tell you that this notion uh, should be, should be hearing in the in the IMO negotiations, actually, because uh, they, they 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 cut the, the the ocean in pieces, but we just have one ocean. On this subject, a question on the interpretation of the reference of the common heritage of mankind in Article uh, 7 of the BBHE Treaty will, uh, will be needed. Finally, next week, members of the European Parliament, as I said, will vote in the plenary of the Nature Restoration Law. Perhaps the representatives of CBD and FAO can tell us what they think about this text, which is essential for biodiversity. This treaty on the IC, ICs is therefore an historic step forward for the protection of the ocean and its resources. We may well ask whether it represents a further step towards the creation of the cup ocean. I'm, I'm trying to push this idea, which was the subject of our appeal in Brest at the One Ocean Summit in February 2022. Oh where we called for recognition uh, for the ocean as a global common, but also the creation of the COP ocean 
and an international panel for ocean sustainability, the IPOS, that is uh, currently uh, in preparation for 2025, the UNOC, the UN Ocean Conference that will uh, stay in, in, in France, in, in Nice, in Nice, in the, in the city of Nice. Thank you very much for your attention and uh, have a great session. I'm, give, I'm giving uh, the, the floor to Mina for the moderation. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Chabot, for taking us along that ocean, international ocean governance journey and really highlighting as well the connectivity between climate change and the significant role that you and your role has played as well. You gave example of the Ocean Climate Platform, which again is another example of really the role of civil society and the fact that we need a, a Paris Agreement for the ocean. Um, IMO is, is not on this panel, but again, uh, also an important player and uh, a lot of experience as well in doing regulations, etc. cetera, um, you know, at sea and, and international waters. Um, but we will have a here from many others. And again, I really impressed and, and still very glad to hear that you still have high hopes for the high seas. So uh, on that way, we will continue and also reminding us that we are all connected. It's all connected and therefore we cannot have a fragmented governance. Um, and then taking us all the way up to you know, the third UN uh, United Nations Ocean Conference, which will take place in uh, Nice in June 2025. And hopefully by then we might even be celebrating a BBNJ treaty that has entered into force. So um, we talked and we all know about the challenges of multilateralism. Um, we can say that once again, we did deliver, um, and that is a, a major accomplishment in itself. Um, so I would really like to also extend a heartfelt thank you to all those negotiators, because I know that there was a lot of political pressure towards the end to reach an agreement. Um, and they work night and day, and I witnessed them <laughs> in their fatigue, uh, so on. But it really, uh, they endured that 38-hour marathon in order to reach an agreement. So with us here today, we have uh, Aurore Maillet. Uh, she was um, an EU negotiator for the BBNJ Treaty. Um, she comes from DJ Mari, Arab European Commission. And she's played an, well, the EU and it also uh, played a very instrumental role uh, and also helping to get this treaty over the line. Um, everybody had to demonstrate, as we know, flexibility. So without any further ado, I'd like to hear uh, from Aor, who would talk a little bit about what is in the treaty? What did we get in the end? You know, how is this going to be implemented and, you know, financed, etc. So please, thank you, Aor, and I look forward to hearing about from your intervention. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much, uh, Mina, and thank you to uh, MEP Chabot for uh, setting the scene so excellently on, uh, on ocean governance. And uh, also thank you to the Intergroup for, for organizing this event. I'm very happy to be sitting here among these uh, distinguished panelists, whether it's here in person or on screen. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, indeed, I think that uh, um, um, in the last few months, we have seen really two major events for, for ocean protection. One was the, the conclusion of the Global Biodiversity Framework, the Kunming Montreal Framework in December. Uh, and in particular, uh, of interest to us is this target three, which is to protect uh, and preserve 30% of land and sea by, by 2030. And the second event, of course, was the adoption of the, the, the BBNJ Treaty or, or the Treaty of the High Seas. Um, under UNCLOSE, which, which uh, uh, made the headlines in particular because it will allow uh, uh, the, the creation of marine protected areas in the high seas. Um, so there are a lot of other important elements also in the treaty, so I'll say a bit about, about that, but I really want to say that those two um, events, those two um, uh, agreements taken, taken together really have the potential to be a game changer for ocean governance, and, and, uh, and I, I'll try to explain a little bit uh, 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 of that and how, how that's, that's going to work. But focusing on the, on the BBNJ now, I think uh, Antonio Guterres is the one that, that described it best when he said it's a win for multilateralism. And it's true, the fact that the, it was possible to adopt the treaty in the UN by consensus uh, uh, with the current multilateral situation, I think was, was a, a big challenge. And I think it's uh, 
was probably one of the successes uh, uh, of the EU to, to really uh, um, um, ensure that, that all the key parties uh, were on board. Only the Russian Federation disassociated itself from, from the consensus. They received no support. And so we think that it's also very good news uh, for the implementation of the treaty, because for the treaty to be efficient, we need everybody on board, all the parties on board. So he said that was a win for multilateralism and a win uh, for Russians. And it's true that, that uh, also the results of the treaty was welcomed by um, NGOs quite unanimously. It was welcomed also by the fisheries organizations, including those in the EU. So I think there is a wide degree of consensus that, that's, uh, that uh, really exists at the moment around the High Seas Treaty. And I think that uh, that is uh, um, something that is also quite, uh, quite exceptional and, uh, and uh, that is uh, a good omen for, for the implementation, the future implementation of the treaty and its um, entry into force. So what the treaty does is, is four major things in four major areas of action. The first one, and really the one that has been grabbing hearts and minds and media attention, is the designation of marine protected areas in the high seas. And, and, and that's indeed very important. And that was uh, you know, one of the major priorities of the EU to ensure that it was possible to do that under the Treaty of the High Seas. So now the future conference of the parties under the treaty will be able to designate marine protected areas. We will say here is a marine protected area. It will also be able to come with a, a management plan. So it will say in this marine protected area, you need to take major, measure, measures, A, B, C, D, in order to make sure that the environment is effectively uh, protected, that we are not creating what we call paper parks, so nice MPAs on paper, but nothing happening on the ground. So that's another very important thing that is in the outcome of, of, of the treaty. And, and, and what's even more important, I think, is the process that the treaty sets up in order to designate those marine protected areas. Because what does the treaty say? It says that you need to consult a lot. So you need to consult indigenous people, local communities, stakeholders, NGOs. Of course, you need to have a very strong scientific basis, a very good scientific base. You need to consult with all the other parties. Um, so so uh, the the process which is in the treaty for me is, is, is a consensus building machine. It's going to put everyone around the table to discuss the objective to, to, to protect the high seas. And uh, um, what is very interesting also in the treaty is how it's dealing with other, what we call under the treaty, international framework and bodies. So that means, for instance, regional fisheries management organization, or that could be the IMO, that could be FAO, that could be regional sea conventions, that could be the CBD, et cetera, et cetera, the International Seabed Authority, and so on and so forth. Uh, all those bodies will have something to do and can contribute to the protection of the high seas as well. And the treaty says, okay, BBNJ, when you are going to come up with your list of measures in your marine protected area and you have to decide A, B, C, D, if, if that measure is under the competence of the IMO, for instance, it's going to, to have to do with uh, maritime traffic then the BBNJ cannot take a measure because the IMO has to decide that, but the BBNJ will be able to make a recommendation to the IMO. So it will bring the IMO on the table of that, converse, that uh, conservation um, uh, discussion. The same if it's a fisheries measure, it will turn to a regional fisheries management organization and say, could you please consider, you know, this is what we would recommend as the BBNJ. And that establishing of a conversation, a global conversation around the main objective of the treaty, which is uh, protection and sustainable use, I think is, is, is going to be very useful in terms of ocean governance to, to really bring all the relevant actors in around the table. And for me, I think it's really like one of the biggest added value um, um, of, of that treaty is this forum for building consensus. And that's very important because if, if um, uh, those organizations are not on board, if all parties around the world are not on board, it will be very difficult to have marine protected areas which are actually protected. So, so that is for me the crux of the future implementation of the treaty is that we will have to work all of us here around the table and with many others um, together, together. And that means that, that we'll have to talk to each other a lot. And, and that is a, uh, for me what's going to be fascinating when we start implementing the, the high seas treaty. Uh, another EU priority which made it into the chapter on marine protected area is the fact that it will be possible to vote uh, to designate marine protected areas, and there's a three-quarters majority. So what it means is that it won't be possible for one single party to block forever and ever the establishment of a marine protected area. So that's good. That being said, uh, I really hope that we will be able to designate those marine protected areas by consensus, because as I said, we really need everyone on board. So 
So the, the other important thing, the other area that the treaty looks into is the area of marine um, genetic research. And that's an area that can uh, uh, you know, look technical to some, but what's important to know is that really, or, or to remember about the treaty is that it recognizes that when you are doing uh, marine, research, uh, marine genetic research in the high seas, uh, mostly this research is conducted by rich countries. There are very few, maybe a dozen countries that can afford to have this type of cruises in the high seas. When you do that, the benefits you derive from it afterwards, whether it's benefits in terms of science, uh, for instance, the treaty says all this science should be open access, so accessible to everybody in the world, whether or not you come from a country that can afford a cruise in the high seas, etc. But also the monetary benefits, which was a very difficult discussion we had within the treaty and which I think we have been able to solve um, in a very good way, is also to say when you 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 derive innovations those innova from research that you have made in the high seas, and you will create the next drug that will cure cancer, et cetera. Uh, well, there needs to be also a recognition that the profits will go to a certain number of countries, and these need to be shared with the whole world. So that's part of the contributions that the developing countries will be making to the BBNJ budget will go back to, to, uh, to the implementation of biodiversity as a payment for those monetary benefits. So that's quite an, an innovation, I think, in terms of international law. And that's, uh, I think, what was really uh, something very important to the Global South in the treaty. And that's really going to contribute to, uh, to, to equity. And I think it goes into um, uh, your direction, Madame Chabot, when you say you know, that you are a little bit disappointed about uh, the common good. And I understand that. But I think that the philosophy behind all the provisions in the treaty have this idea in mind that you know we have to share the ocean so whatever the words you you put on it i think the important is that this idea that you are championing somehow makes it into 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 the treaty provisions so so and and i think the the, the chapter on marine genetic resource is really a good example of that uh, and about how how we want to um, um share something which is a common to the entire humanity the third thing that the chapter is doing is to say, hey, if you're going to have um, a big activities in the high seas, you need to have an environmental impact assessment. Uh, and also, you need to screen all, a lot of the activities that you would be doing in the high seas to decide whether or not they meet the threshold to have an environmental impact assessment. That's, uh, that's quite important. This was a, a provision that existed in UNCLOSE but wasn't spelled out. And what the treaty does is that it really spells it out giving a lot of guidance about how it should be. And then other important thing that the BBNJ will do is that it will set standards and guidelines for environmental impact assessments. And that's also something where it will be important for the BBNJ to cooperate with those other international institutions that are doing environmental impact assessment, even though if you are doing an environmental impact assessment under another body like IMO or an RFMO, normally you are not covered by the EIA provisions of the BBNJ. Nevertheless, it's true that this global discussion on what is a good environmental impact assessment, how to do it, et cetera, is also a discussion that is going to happen around the implementation of the BBNJ, I think, and that's, that's also very important. Another priority for the, for the EU that uh, we managed to land in the, the treaty was the fact that there's a possibility you not know, to do what we call strategic environmental impact assessment. So for big projects that, um, and not only for each little individual project. So uh, uh, there's a lot of consideration to be given to climate change, to biodiversity. So that links in also very nicely with, uh, with, uh, with the work of the UNFCCC, the work of the CBD and so on. Uh, so, so, um, and, and, and then, of course, the fourth thing is that there's very strong capacity building element uh, into, into the treaty, also for the reasons I've outlined in the chapter on marine genetic uh, uh, research, um, so that there is some support to developing countries. And I think that's uh, um, um, uh, something that will be also very important for the EU, that we're able to be there and to uh, support this capacity building. We are the world's major donor, so I think it's important that we are there and that we are um, um, active on capacity building, and I'm sure that there will be an important role for the parliament in that when they will be deciding on the budget. So please remember us <laughs> when you have those, those discussions. Um, now what we need to do is to have the treaty ratified by 60 parties so that it can enter into force. So uh, the EU is working on its uh, own ratification. We are trying to be as speedy as we can possibly be in, in, in this process. So. Uh, we have been working very hard on this uh, since we came back from the, the BBNJ negotiations. 
um, and and uh, we are also engaging with other parties to encourage them to support. We have we are we are currently programming the Global Ocean Program, uh, uh, which is with the help of INPA, who is uh, there uh, to uh, to uh, find ways to support already uh, uh, the BBNJ implementation to support those who want to ratify and so on. Uh, so, so we are there. We are part of the, the conversation on implementation. Uh, it was a new priority to get this deal. As you said, the EU has been very active. We launched a high ambition coalition, which has 52 members now on the BBNJ to try and push for, for the deal. This coalition now still exists, and, and, and we hope that it will be also very important in the implementation of the BBNJ. So we have rolled up our sleeves, and, and we still have a lot of work to do. Actually, I think getting the deal was the easy part. And now the complicated part starts uh, with the implementation and, and all the hard work that, uh, that it takes. Because if we want to have 30% uh, of the high seas protected by 2030, we have uh, well, six years and a half left. So that's, that's really like a minute in international policy time. So, so there, is, there is an urgency. And we, I don't need to remind everyone why, why there is such a, a global urgency, I think. Uh, and that said, I would also like to wish Anifi Shabo all the best and the Parliament all the best in the very important vote in the plenary on the nature restoration law. Uh, I think it is important in the EU that, that we show that what we are championing internationally, we're also able to do at home. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for again taking us through the whole package deal, what you've got. And, as we mentioned as um, comment before uh, when we were talking, it's very unique to actually have a treaty where everyone is happy. Um, of course, no one is fully happy because otherwise it wouldn't be successful negotiation. But on the other hand, it also means that civil society was happy with it, um, you know, but from the industry perspective, etc. So I think this is very unique and really highlighting that you know, European EU's role in establishing marine protected areas, which is something that obviously IUCN share in terms of having to have a scientific technical body, uh, not voting, not by consensus. So it also shows that we've learned from other international processes um, and we shall continue to do so. Uh, again, everything that you mentioned is great, but, but also I'm very happy to hear that um, not just to focus on marine genetic resources in terms of you know, the access and benefit sharing, but also thinking of research and giving adequate access for, for all nations as well to access the, the research. And, and that's also part of equity. Um, and again, really pleased to hear the active role that the EU will play in, in supporting capacity building. That is key. Um, and again, you mentioned the 30 by 30. Yes, it's a tight run, but we're in the race to win it, right? So we will do all that we can to really, um, as you said, within all the procedures and processes that need to establish, but does take time, but, you know, trying to accelerate it as much as possible. Um, so now um, I'd like to, so we said that there are different, um, the BB&J can learn from other international processes. Um, we actually have the next speaker, which will be um, Mary Chiachi. Uh, she will give us, an, uh, she will provide an intervention. She comes from International Rela Relations on Access and Benefit Sharing under the Nagoya Protocol. And she works for GG Environment, EU Commission. I believe she's online. And would, could you please share with us your intervention and also remind all speakers to, to stick to the time as we're a little bit short. We want to keep a lot of time for questions in the end. So... Mary, are, are you online? I'll be happy to give I you am. the floor. I hope you can hear me well. Good morning to everybody. Thanks a lot for inviting me to this very interesting uh, uh, event. Um, yeah, I, thanks for sharing the presentation. I've prepared a, a, um, a presentation to go through the content of the global biodiversity framework, which was uh, uh, mentioned also by my colleague uh, Aurora a moment ago. Uh, which definitely signed a milestone, I will say, in the global protection of uh, 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 environment and in particular conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity and benefit sharing from uh, genetic resources as well. Uh, maybe we can go to the next uh, slide. Thank you. Yeah, precisely. Um, in Montreal, uh, in December 2022, uh, COP15, the Conference of the Parties uh, of the Convention on Biological Diversity, uh, successfully adopted the Global Biodiversity Framework, which is now known as the Kunmin Montreal Biodiversity Framework. Uh, 
as you probably know, uh, um, the presidency of the COP was run by, by China and the conference was supposed to be held in China, but because of uh, 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 health issues related still to the pandemic, COVID pandemic, it was not possible to uh, um, uh, have the conference in China. And then this was hosted by uh, 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 Canada. This is why we have this uh, <laughs> uh, um, long name. But uh, uh, besides that, I think that we have to uh, highlight and stress the fact that COVID certainly uh, delayed the adoption of this framework of two years because this was supposed to be adopted in 2020 when the urgency was already there and I would say that now is even uh, 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 more uh, evident to everybody and, I, and I'm of course talking about the loss of biodiversity and the fact that this is uh, of course related also to climate change and is impacting many other relevant uh, 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 policies for the survival of, of, of humankind, but also of other species, uh, animal ecosystems, and everything is needed for, for, for well, the well-being of our uh, uh, planet. So it was really urgent, it was really needed, and we managed to adopt it, even if the circumstances were not ideal. And of course, there were several challenges also related to the political climate, like, of course, the 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 the, the, the um, war in Ukraine and the food crisis and many and many others. But I would say that really the EU, uh, uh, together with the member states, played a, 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 a relevant role in these negotiations. I would even say a, 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 a leadership role in uh, um, trying to find compromises only on the, also on those very, very uh, um, complex issues like for instance the issue of establishing a new fund for biodiversity and benefit sharing from digital sequence information which is related to my uh, to genetic resources we can go to the next slide uh, so the uh, in a nutshell um the the at COP15, we adopted a very ambitious uh, uh, framework, which is complemented by other five important decisions. One is on the monitoring framework. So this is actually the framework that will ensure that we will monitor the progress uh, uh, up to 2030 and then to 2050 with the achievement of the goals and targets in, in the GBF. There is also a decision, of course, on planning reporting and review of the implementation. And this was also very important because in the past, what we have seen in the global governance of, of biodiversity is that even if we have very good uh, uh, targets, uh, like the EG targets, for instance, or, um, or very good objectives in the convention or other multilateral environmental agreements, we don't have Sorry, there's something that is bothering me here. Okay, we don't have uh, a stronger uh, uh, system for reporting and, and planning and review. So this was really something very, very important that we managed to achieve. Then there is a very important decisions on mobilizing additional resources from all sources for the conservation and, and uh, 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 sustainable use of, of biodiversity, which is somehow linked also to the issue of sharing benefits from digital sequence information on genetic resources. This was a very critical topic in the negotiations. It was, uh, was a very debated uh, 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 issue. Developed, uh, developing countries argued that since technologies has, has changed the current instruments on access and benefit sharing, and the main one is the Nagoya Protocol, but we also have the FAO Treaty, for instance, on, 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 uh, uh, for food and agriculture, on plant genetic resources, and now we have the BBNJ. Uh, well, anyway, they, they were saying that these instruments are somehow obsolete because now uh, users of genetic resources mainly use DNA sequences in databases. And this is hampering their possibilities to share the benefits out of the utilization of sequences derived from their own genetic resources. This was very critical because, of course, the, the, the potential uh, uh, impacts also on open science, on open uh, uh, access to information, which is crucial in the EU, but I would say worldwide for, 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 for research, for boosting research also in, in the scientific uh, uh, relevant sectors for, for biodiversity uh, uh, was uh, 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 one of the main points that we needed to preserve. So uh, car the, the system under the Nagoya protocol was not certainly the good one because it would have affected uh, uh, open access. Then there was a need to come up with different solution. And then the decisions on uh, uh, sharing benefits from digital sequence information establishes now a mechanism 
multilateral mechanism for the sharing of benefits out of this uh, 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 sequence. The modalities will still have to be um, defined. The mechanism is, is established and there is also a provision to establish a fund for these benefits, which could be part of the fund for the resource mobilization or um, a different fund. It is to be uh, decided, to be discussed. Uh, the, there is an open-ended working group that is established. It will uh, uh, meet for the first time in November in Geneva, and then there will be a second meeting up to uh, COP16 at the end of next year. And hopefully we will have the modalities of the mechanism defined and also the issue of the fund, whether it should be a different one or it should be part of the uh, fund uh, 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 for the uh, Global Biodiversity Framework, the trust fund that was established at COP15. And in, I think last week there was a meeting of the GEF uh, Council in Brasilia, which precisely started to discuss the modalities of the fund, including also the linkages with, with the fund for uh, digital sequence information. I'm stressing this because my colleague Aror precisely before mentioned the fact that the benefit sharing chapter on the BBNJ is likely to generate additional resources for conservation of, of uh, uh, marine genetic resources. And this will be part, in our view, of the overall uh, global efforts to precisely uh, uh, um, uh, achieve the goal and targets under the GBF on increasing benefit sharing from, from genetic uh, uh, resources and ideally to further contribute to uh, uh, conservation of uh, 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 biodiversity. Um, then the last important decision is on capacity building, which was of course uh, a, a necessary one because many developing countries argue that uh, in order to achieve those important goals and targets in the in the in the GBF, uh, there was a need also to boost their capacity uh, through all form of capacity building, and the capacity building will also be linked to the to the funds that have been established. We can go to the next slide. Thank you. So, uh, in terms of vision, is uh, of of the global biodiversity. Uh, framework division is up to 2050, when by then we should all live in harmony uh, uh, with nature. Uh, the mission is that by 2030, we will have halt and, and reverse biodiversity uh, uh, loss and put nature on a path to recovery. In order to achieve this, both major, the mission and the vision, we have set four outcome-oriented goals. Uh, the outcome is precisely by 20, to be achieved by 2050. And the four goals are on conservation and restoration, on sustainable use of, of biodiversity, on benefit sharing, and on means of implementations. These goals are complemented by 23 action-oriented targets by 2030. So the actions that need to be set up or improved uh, by 2030 in order to precisely achieve those four goals. Uh, so from target one to target eight, uh, we are addressing the, driver, the drivers of biodiversity loss from target 9 to target 13, the sustainable use of biodiversity and benefit sharing. From target 14 and target 23, uh, uh, we're talking about the tools and solutions for, for mainstreaming uh, biodiversity, non-relevant policies, and of course, the tools of implementation. Next, next please. Uh, yeah, uh, now I think... Uh, it was a great success in uh, in in, in uh, uh, Montreal. I think this had a very positive effect on many other processes, like for instance, also the the, the uh, in premise, I would say the, the BBNJ uh, that was successfully adopted in uh, uh, in spring. Uh, but there are many challenges, of course, now, uh, and and the first one relate to the implementation. As I said before, there was a real urgency to adopt such a framework. But now, I mean, this means that we have to speed up with the implementation and we have uh, to do it uh, in, in a very um, thorough and comprehensive uh, way. So we are all committed now to full and sweet implementation of existing policies uh, related to uh, 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 biodiversity. And I'm, of course, not referring referring also only on um, to biodiversity, terrestrial biodiversity, but also marine biodiversity, ocean biodiversity, everything. Um, then, of course, uh, there is also a need to assess whether we have any gaps uh, 
uh, including in our uh, uh, current legislation. So now, as Commission, we are in the process of identifying uh, uh, precisely opportunities and gaps between EU uh, 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 national targets and, and the targets in the, in the GBF. And this is an exercise that member states are also undertaking at the moment. And then there are several follow-up processes, like for instance, I mentioned the process on benefit sharing and resource mobilization, but they are also on uh, um, the identification of uh, all relevant indicators for the monitoring framework, because we could not adopt all indicators at the uh, um, uh, in, in Montreal, because we lacked some relevant information, scientific information. So in general, I would say that uh, the entry into force of the BBNJ and its implementations potentially can greatly contribute to the achievement of several goals and targets of the, of the uh, global biodiversity framework. At the same time, we also believe that uh, the, the implementation, the effective implementation of the GBF can deploy post positive effects for, for the BBNJ. And now we can see maybe a little bit more in detail uh, 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 which targets maybe are more relevant for, for the BBNJ uh, discussion. Next, please. Next slide. OK, thank you. Yeah, Aurora mentioned before uh, target 13 precisely, which is known as the 30 by 30. So uh, it, and the target 13 by 2030, we should uh, protect at least 30% of terrestrial and inland water areas and of marine and coastal areas uh, of particular relevance for, for, for biodiversity and ecosystem uh, functions and, 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 uh, and services. So those areas should be conserved and managed through uh, um, ecologically and well-connected and equitably governed systems of protected areas precisely. So this, I would say, is the, 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 the core of the, of the GBF and is certainly also uh, uh, the, the probably most relevant target for um, the, 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 the BBNJ. But there are also other uh, important targets, like for instance, the next one, next slide which is precisely the one on benefit sharing and also the decision on digital sequence information. Uh, I, I, I think I explained the, uh, already a little bit the background, but under target 13, we uh, are committed by 2030 to take all effective legal policy, administrative and capacity building measures to ensure that benefit sharing uh, uh, takes place in a, in a, in a fair manner, in an equitable manner, and of course, also that this uh, uh, is that the benefit sharing is significantly increased. Uh, I would say that the BBNJ, as such, as an instrument, and 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 when then it will be enforced and will be implemented, can definitely constitute. Sorry, dear, um, dear Ms. Chiachi? Yes, yeah. I, I would lead you to wrap up uh, because we um, need to have time for the Q and A. So maybe we can save some of the information for the Q and A. Thank you. Yeah, yeah, I am. Um, so I would say that the BBNJ certainly constitute one of these uh, uh, instruments. And then on DSI, I think the issue is even uh, uh, more relevant. Mm, as I said, there is ongoing discussions on the modalities, but on the BBNJ, there is also the potential that this, uh, um, that the, the benefit sharing from DSI from marine genetic resources could also uh, be part of the global uh, multilateral mechanism established under, under CBD and further contribute to conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. Next slide. Yeah, here is just uh, very quickly to say that there are also many other targets, like the target on, on, on climate and, and of course, uh, um, one of the of the uh, measures to take here is to minimize the impact of climate change on, and ocean acidification. So this is what I would I was saying before. BBNJ can certainly contribute to GBF. On the other hand, also the uh, uh, the GBF can contribute to uh, boost uh, uh, the global uh, environmental governance of, of ocean that the BBNJ is trying to establish. Next slide. Okay, maybe the last target. Sorry, and then I, I'm really going to have to ask you to to wrap up. Thank you. Okay, this is the most a very important uh, uh, element, and it's about the uh, targets on resource mobilizations. We all have committed to double global biodiversity finance uh, 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 by 2030. And as I said before, uh, this goes to this is not referring to contributions at state, let's say, uh, from 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 parties, but from 
resources from all sources. So the big challenge now is really to mobilize the private sector and uh, everybody is taking advantage of, of the use of biodiversity and contributed to the protection of biodiversity. This goes together also with the uh, 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 goal to uh, identify the harmful incentives and uh, 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 reduce them until we can eliminate them. I can conclude here. Thank you very much. Um, so yes, very interesting, but we are very short of time. So each speaker has 10 minutes for an intervention and we, a lot of people have shown up here today to be able to, to ask questions and I'm sure they have questions for you as well. So please stay with us, but thank you for sharing everything, the importance on the resource mobilization and what, we, what the BBNJ can learn from this, particularly also the digital sequence of information and the mechanism established. So as you can hear, once we're running out of time, we start speaking faster and I know there's no one in the interpretation booth, so I will speak slowly. Um, I'm very pleased to, to introduce um, our next speaker, which is uh, Ms. Jihoon Lee. She's the Director of Science Society and Sustainable Futures Division from the Secretariat of the Convention of Bio Biological Diversity. And she's really here to basically unfold the relationship between the new High Seas Treaty and the CBD, but look at it from a high level uh, global perspective and the process and mechanism, what we can actually learn from the CBD and its many years of scientific guidance or whatever. So I leave it to you and thank you so much uh, for being here today and for sticking with time. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Mina. It's really a great pleasure to be in a panel moderated by you. My sincere thanks also to the organizer, EP Intergroup on Climate Change, Biodiversity, Sustainable Development, in particular, to Ms. Catherine Schobo. It's really an honor to meet you in person, uh, especially for her remarkable leadership on ocean and climate issues and inspiring the organization of this event. Thank you so much. My heartfelt thanks also go to Despina and her excellent team at the Intergroup Secretariat for inviting CBD Secretary to join this important event. I also acknowledge with deepest thanks the presence of speaker from DG Mare and DG Environment together with colleagues and friends from FAO, NIAP and OSPA. I particularly appreciate the previous speaker because she provided really nice comprehensive uh, summary of GBF so that I can save time also from my presentation. I'm here today representing CBD Secretariat to brief you on how CBD and its Secretariat has contributed to the development of BBNJ agreement in past 20 years through sharing its scientific and technical work and discuss how we can continue to support the future implementation of this new very important agreement by sharing CBD's 30 years of experience on biodiversity conservation and sustainable use, as well as nearly 10 years of experience of Nagoya Protocol on access and beneficiary of, uh, uh, on genetic resources, as you have heard very uh, comprehensively from the previous speaker. So next uh, slide, please. So this is the family photo from the last day on uh, June uh, 19 of uh, its adoption. Personally, after 17 years of uh, direct involvement in the negotiation, I was personally honored to witness the last moment of approval of final negotiated text last March after 30 year, uh, 36 hours of fasting in a, in a room uh, without any food uh, and without any sleep. That was really interesting. And the adoption of the agreement under the United Nations uh, Convention um, uh, on the law of the sea on this uh, BBNJ uh, two weeks ago on 19 June. In past 20 years, BBNJ process gathered not only negotiators from member states, but also all the representatives, experts, and practitioners from relevant UN international organization, regional bodies, NGOs, academes, and many other civil society organizations and create this whole community of global ocean biodiversity in the name of BBNJ family. In this sense, what has been achieved is more than an agreement. And today I suggest we all focus on realizing this wealth of uh, network, knowledge and experience, which would allow us to co-design and co-create 
the practical and effective way of cooperation, collaboration, and coordination for the future implementation of BBNJ agreement. I see, I, I, I really hope that you can read this from this photo uh, of historic moment. Next, please. As you have also seen from the previous speaker's slide, on the day of adoption at the BBNJ, uh, many delegates highlighted that the adoption of BBNJ agreement is a remarkable achievement in multilateralism. And you have witnessed that at the adoption of, uh, in the middle of night of uh, GBF, Together with this Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework and also many other important outcome of COP15 in December last year, this BBNJ agreement can help to put humanity on a path to achieve the 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. This major global development will certainly enhance our common efforts to conserve and sustainably use our oceans, and to share fairly and equitably the benefits from the utilization of marine genetic resources. Next, please. The Kunming Montreal Global Biodiversity Framework sets out four outcome-oriented goals to be achieved by 2050 and 23 action-oriented targets to be achieved by 2030 in order to halt and reverse biodiversity loss and to put nature on the path to recovery. Nearly all the 23 targets are highly relevant to the drivers of biodiversity loss that the BBNJ agreement is addressing, as well as the policy measures and tools proposed in the agreement. Next, please. So this is a, a diagram showing the linkages be, between the elements of BBNJ and all the scientific and technical work that has been providing inputs to the BBNJ development. The BBNJ agreement will surely boost the implementation of GBF, but it's not only GBF. It has been really the whole work of a marine program of uh, uh, CBD uh, in past 20 years, and which will become also foundation for our future cooperation. As you can see in this slide, many elements of the uh, agreement provide clear opportunities for synergies and sharing knowledge and experience with work conducted under the CBD. These include, uh, just name a few, ecologically or biologically significant marine areas, impact assessment, biodiversity mainstreaming, area-based conservation, capacity building, access and beneficiary for genetic resources, and the clearinghouse mechanism, among so many others. We are also pleased to see that provision on digital sequence information on marine genetic resources have been drafted. Taking into account the outcome of the COP15 on this issue, clearly underlining the importance of our respective work being mutually supportive. CBD COP has acknowledged the importance of the BBNJ agreement and the need for synergies between our respective processes. For example, COP15, specifically requested the Secretariat to identify potential options for modalities for collaboration and cooperation with relevant global and regional organization in the context of the agreement. In that sense, this meeting is really timely. Building on our existing collaboration with relevant competent organization, including through the Sustainable Ocean Initiative, global dialogue with regional seas organization and regional fisheries bodies, CBD Secretary stands ready to continue its collaboration to support the implementation of this historic agreement. Let me share briefly some of scientific and technical areas that could be built on for future cooperation. I will go very quickly. Next slide, please. The EPSAS. I don't know how much uh, you are familiar with the EPSA process, but uh, CBD Secretary in past uh, more than a decade uh, has informed the deliberation of BBNJ process, bringing all this very science-rich uh, EPSA description, um, identifying very special areas in the ocean. The EPSA process through regional workshop has covered nearly 76% uh, of global ocean area and about 20% of global ocean area has been described as meeting the scientific criteria for EPSAS. 
All the relevant scientific information has been shared with UNGA and as requested by CBD Cup and made available in the global EPSA repository of CBD website. You can see with the map, with polygons, and with the, all the scientific assessment uh, done, uh, compiled by the, the scientists and all the list of references. So let's move to the next slide. And all the guidance and tools. The secretary has informed uh, on various relevant guidance and uh, guidelines emerging from the conference of the parties from the CBD, such as the voluntary guidelines on biodiversity inclusive environmental impact assessment and strategic environmental assessment, which were annotated particularly for marine and coastal areas, including A, B, and J, as well as guidelines on marine protected areas, OECM, other effective area-based conservation measures, marine spatial planning, or those uh, guidelines addressing various uh, uh, threats on biodiversity loss. Next, please. And we have also this platform called Sustainable Ocean In Initiative, which was also acknowledged uh, by UNJ resolution, created at COP10 at the time it was responding to, to the implementation for IT target in Nagoya. And it has survived all these years and still providing a platform for uh, partnership, especially to help developing countries with the implementation through capacity building. And since 2016, it has also uh, initiated this global dialogue with the various uh, uh, regional CIS organization and regional fisheries bodies together with FAO and UNAP. And actually, all the speakers in, uh, to, in today's panel are part of our partnership. And then this will provide a very good uh, uh, effective framework for the cooperation also for the future. Next, please. Clearing house mechanism will be an important tool for the implementation of BBNJ agreement, in particular related to fair and equitable sharing of benefits or from the utilization of marine genetic resources. CBD and its two protocols have a long-term experience, including both success and, of course, failure stories. And sometimes failure stories can provide very good lessons on the development and operationalization of clearinghouse mechanism. And this experience could be another area of future cooperation that we can share. Next, please. I'm almost there. So as explained so far, CBD and its secretariat have accompanied BBNJ family throughout this uh, long journey in 20 years in achieving the historic adoption of BBNJ agreement. In particular, CBD Secretariat highly appreciate our close collaboration with colleagues at UN Division for Ocean Affairs and the Law of the Sea, who has guided this BBNJ process with such dedicated efforts and professionalism. I believe they were too busy to finalize the the agreement in June and could not be part of it uh, this event, but hope that we can have another event soon with them. So, uh, uh, in I, I mentioned this COP15 request that CBD Secretary is tasked to uh, explore the, the modality for cooperation. So we started conversation with the Dualos to identify possible areas for future cooperation. In fact, I'm having a meeting uh, with them uh, next week in, in New York. So we'll continue this and also in through various fora like this event, we'll continue our conversation with various other partner organization, of course, including IUCN, all the regional bodies, and then other, other global bodies within UN Ocean uh, Coordination Mechanism so that we can most effectively support and contribute to the future implementation of BBNJ agreement and creating synergies as requested by the COP with our common efforts for achieving global goals and targets of the GBF. So my last one, with thanks, I invite all of you to join hands. Last slide, please. To join hands moving forward from agreement to action to build back biodiversity in both national and ABNJ. Thank you so much.
Thank you very much, uh, Ms. Lee uh, Jihun Lee. I think this was really inspirational and I could really sense your excitement for this and really hopeful and all the great things we have ahead of us and really emphasizing the need for collaboration, cooperation and coordination at all levels. And IUCN has a long-standing relationship with the CBD uh, Secretariat and other parties and we will continue to work together. Um, and Nagoya Protocol and the guidance was one really good example used by many groups. Um, and also for reminding us of the important sustainable ocean initiative and the platform that it provides. I think this was, was really excellent. And you recently had a workshop on capacity building. Um, one final thing that I thought that you raised and you actually reminded us again, it was great to see that slide in terms of mapping out the, the synergies, but we cannot forget the clearinghouse mechanism is so crucially important. So we'll learn from, from you, your successes and your failures. And you can also claim that it's not really a failure, right? It's, it's a step towards uh, progress, so to, towards success. Um, so thank you very much. And thank you for coming all the way here. Um, now we are going to, well, we're going to, of course, stay in the high seas. And we know there's many different activities that takes place on the high seas. Um, one of them obviously being fisheries and the need for well-managed fisheries. So we have also with us, unfortunately, not here in the room, but online, uh, we have um, Mr. Manuel Barange. He's the Director for Fisheries and Aquaculture Division within the Food and Agricultural FAO Organization of United Nations. Um, so I will be happy to invite you now, uh, Mr. Barange, to, to share with us some experience um, and what good should look like. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mina, and, and good good morning, everybody. I, I hope that you can see me and hear me okay. Um, yeah, I hope that you do, and perhaps just if you can give me a thumbs up that you can see my presentation as well. <laughs> yes, you do. Um, thank you. Uh, so you have asked me to uh, talk to you about well-managed fisheries in the high seas. That's the title that you um, that you gave me, and I'm very happy to talk about this. And particularly, just to say, first on a very personal note, um, that, um, it, you know, I started my career, I don't know whether you can hear me or not, because I see a lot of movement in the, in the podium. Can you please tell me whether, whether you can hear me? Yes, we can hear you fine. We were just trying to get you also on the, the screen, um, oh, so we right. can have those simultaneously. Apologies. Please thank you, go ahead. thank you. Very much. Thank you very much, Mina. Uh, no, just to say that it, personally, it's a great it's it's a great thing to see the BBNJ treaty completed. Uh, I started my career as a as a fisheries observer in the high seas fleets um, before moving into being a, a fisheries uh, scientist in in for governments and then an academic and um, before moving into the international arena. So uh, the BBNJ treaty is is a, is a great success and it's great to have it. Uh, if you can have the next uh, slide, please. Just first talk a little bit about biodiversity and the sustainability on the high seas. Next slide. To mention, of course, as everyone knows that the high seas occupy two thirds of the world's ocean and that the sustainable utilization uh, of marine biological diversity and the conservation of marine biological diversity go hand in hand. And this is very well um, encapsulated in the BPNJ Treaty. Um, as you would have noticed, perhaps, uh, that um, uh, the term conservation appears 35 times, the term sustainable use appears 34 times, uh, and the term protection, protected areas, always appears in connection to um, um, the combination of conservation and sustainable use. So it's very important that uh, we understand that uh, we cannot exclude human activities from the equation because that will not yield lasting solutions. And for this reason, the sustainable and effective management of fisheries is critical. Now, BBNJ is not the first um, agreement that touches on fisheries in the high seas. In fact, you know, if we look back into the history um, of, of this area, the United Nations Convention of the Law of the Sea was uh, entered into force actually in, 90, in 1994, so less than 30 years ago. Um, there was a, a fish stocks agreement uh, that entered into force in 2001 that regulated fishing of migratory species. And in 2003, a new agreement entered into force uh, called the Compliance Agreement to um, put attention on the responsibilities of flag states operating on fisheries in the high seas. 
and more recently in 2016, the Port States Measures Agreement that regulates or prevents uh, IOU fishing puts the pressure on port states um, in relation to high seas as well as EZ operations. Um, so there's a long history of um, organ organizations and agreements in relation to fisheries and high seas that all focus on sustainable and effective fisheries management. Next. Now, let's look a little bit about the importance of the BBNJ Treaty itself when it comes to fisheries. Next slide. First, uh, recognize that the, the agreement is elevating global efforts to promote sustainable use of marine biological diversity, um, taking marine ecosystem conservation on the high seas at two new heights. The BBNJ forces collaboration and establishes a robust legal and institutional framework for ocean governance. It provides opportunities to strengthen capacities to promote biological diversity in areas beyond national jurisdiction. It facilitates the establishment of area-based management measures. I think this is very important to recognize um, that the treaty talks about area-based management as the, as the corner store cornerstone of the agreement. Um, if you look at the, the agreement itself, the text refers to area-based management measures, including marine protected areas. Um, and this is very important because area-based management is what the agreement is about. Um, please remember as well that when it's mentioned marine protected areas, that there is a definition of marine protected area in the agreement. And that, um, that definition uh, also allows for sustainable use. So it's very important to understand that we, you know, we don't we our obligation as an international organization and intergovernmental organization is to interpret the agreement based exactly of what the agreement is about, and it is about area-based management measures. It promotes technology transfer, and it will drive progress towards the achievement of the 2030 agenda. Next. Now, FAO is, is a very trusted partner for BBNJ implementation. I just want to say that FAO was deeply involved since the inception of the discussions on the treaty in 2007, more or less, um, being part of the ad hoc open-ended informal working group, and then the preparatory committee, and then through all the, um, the five um, IGCs uh, meetings that led to, um, to the agreement. So we feel that we are very well placed to, to help members in implement the agreement. Next. The areas that we will offer support to members, first of all, um, let me just mention data collection and analysis, because of course we are the international organization responsible for global fisheries data collection, analysis, um, interpretation and dissemination. And we play a pivotal role in driving sustainable fisheries worldwide. We have a number of platforms like a coordinated working party on statistics that defines what data should include and how to um, to validate and curate that data. But in particular, our role will be in terms of ocean governments, in terms of coherence and coordination of ocean governance. Um, as I mentioned, ocean governance actually has a long history of agreements. The BBNJ is by no means the first one. And th those agreements need to be, uh, if you want, for a lack of a better word, need to be massaged, massaged in to make sure that they, they are consistent and they, they, as, uh, they help each other, just as the BBNG agreement requires. Um, in particular, I just want to, next slide, uh, recognize that there is a very large network of uh, regional fisheries bodies, um, some of them regional fisheries management organizations, and the RFMOs have management responsibilities as they title uh, indicate um, based on the uh, commitments that the, the, the its members uh, have given them, but there's a number of other organisations providing uh, coordination in the in the high seas, and it is going to be very interesting to make sure that the development of these uh, regional fisheries bodies, and there will be new ones uh, for sure as a result of BPNJ, that are actually consistent and and coordinated with the implementation of BPNJ. We will be uh, committed to supporting the ratification and implementation of the BBNJ treaty um, through the members, through the FAO members, uh, leveraging uh, the network that we have of regional fisheries, fisheries bodies. 
Uh, I just want to mention as well that all these bodies, in fact, are represented in the FAO Fisheries Committee that meets every two years, and that in fact this week, and the reason why I'm not in Brussels to you, with you today is because this week the FAO is running its conference that is running every four years, and that conference has created a new fisheries management subcommittee in FAO that every two years will be looking at fisheries management advancements, and I think that the regulation of the high seas, the management um, through the regional fisheries management organizations will be key uh, to these debates in, in FAO. Next. We will be working as well in terms of developing capacity in members, particularly in relation to um, um, uh, implementation of area-based management tools to conserve and manage fish stocks, uh, protected habitats, and preserve vulnerable marine ecosystems, which are things that are we, we've been doing for, for some time. Um, next slide. I think that I'll just want to highlight two very important and very large programs that FAO has in terms of hand, hands-on support uh, to countries. We have a number of projects relevant to BBNJ, specifically the EAF Nansen and the uh, Global Environmental Facility Common Oceans Program that are very relevant. First mentioning the EAF Nansen, which is a, a program that has more than 45 years of history in FAO, supporting approximately 32 African countries at the moment, building capacity on fisheries biology, on fisheries management, on stock assessment. But to note that in the last few years, um, the, the Nansen and, and the program is anchored on the Dr. Fritjof Nansen research vessel has actually conducted five large high seas surveys providing information in some of the least observed um, um, ocean areas of the world. And in the next phase that is about to start includes linkages uh, to international governments and BBHS specifically and has five large high seas surveys planned. Next. At the same time, um, the Common Oceans, which is a global environmental facility program uh, that has been running already for uh, an, almost 10 years um, on the, the high seas, has already helped in the first phase uh, um, create 18 new areas to protect, protect vulnerable marine ecosystems, reduce pollution, and rebuild tuna stocks. We are very pleased to say that 78% of tuna stocks in the world are no longer overfished, and 85% of the tunas in the markets are from uh, sustainable stocks partially thanks for, these, for the work of this program. Um, the second phase of this program is just started, focusing again on tuna, on deep sea fisheries, and, and cross-sectoral cooperation. Next. I'm aware of the, the time, so I'm just going to very quickly to the last bits that some of the things that we're going to be doing in FAO is first translating the BPNJ Treaty for the fisheries and aquaculture sector. There's much to be done there to fully understand the implications, how to massage those with the regulations inside RFMOs, developing a program of collaboration and capacity building. I think that it is important that a spotlight is placed on RFMOs so that their performance improves. Some of them are very effective, some less effective. For the same reasons, in fact, that the BPNJ might become successful or less successful because all these agreements require political will, require financial support, and some of the RFMOs are better, better funded than, than others. But we will be working with them to um, supplement and uh, support ratification effort of the members, enhance the capacity of the members to operationalize the treaty, and coordinate better with RFMOs the outcomes. Next. And just to end, uh, of course, the FAO has a long history of, uh, of development of normative work in relation to high seas, high seas fisheries, be that bottom trawling, bottom fisheries, uh, pelagic um, fisheries, uh, climate impacts in the deep ocean, um, habitat protection, vulnerable marine ecosystems, catch documentation schemes for deep sea fisheries. And this very rich information is what we use continuously to support members and we will do that in terms of supporting the BBNJ implementation. And to end my last slide, um, it is important to recognize that we need to transform the way that we use marine resources, transform the way that we use the marine environment. Um, that is part of the uh, FAO vision of blue transformation that perhaps some of you might or might not have heard of. Harnessing the possibility of tomorrow, there's a great potential and great expectations on the marine environment 
for all sorts of purposes, and we need to make sure that those purposes are sustainably used for the benefit of all. Thank you very much, Mina, over to you. Thank you very, very much, Manuel. Thank you for the excellent presentation, and it's hard to be succinct on such a big topic, but you really reminded us of some of the core elements of the BBNJ Treaty, but also specifically the areas of support that FAO can actually contribute to this process. So thank you for, for highlighting that. And also a reminder to all of us that was you alluded to, which is that we have to look at this new treaty as an opportunity, as a platform for collaboration. And that is why it's key that all international framework and bodies need to work together and see so that you know, we also can approach our support and capacity building in a coordinated effort. But thank you very much and good luck with this week in, in Rome. Okay, great. So uh, thank you very much, uh, Manuel. And now we need to move on uh, swiftly uh, since we, it's not fair to the last speaker, but uh, um, MEP Ms. Chabron is really kind. We'll be able to stay a few more minutes, but we also have to respect that people have other commitments. Um, so without any further ado, we'd like to now turn over to Darius Campbell, who's been uh, waiting also patiently online, uh, as you could not be here with us today. And we've been talking about the regional fisheries management organization and their role. And um, Darius, you will be talking on behalf of the Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Commission and talking about um, the collaboration or the linkages between RFMOs and the BBNJ Treaty. So Darius, I hope you can hear and see us and over to you. Thank you. And please remember to keep within time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, and I will keep into time. Um, I think I've got some slides coming up very quickly. So thank you very much for the invitation and thank you, Mina, for the introduction. Yes, I'm, in fact, I've been involved in the negotiations uh, under, for the BBNJ since 2006 under various hats. So I'm very happy to speak about the implementation of uh, BBNJ as we're looking forward to that. So on to the next slide. So very briefly, we, uh, Northeast Atlantic Fisheries Commission, NIAFC, we're a high seas fisheries, uh, regional fisheries management organization. And of course, we focus on fisheries with all their social and economic benefits, but our convention also includes conservation objectives. Um, and remember, of course, fisheries is intimately reliant on the ecosystem that it also impacts. So next slide. Throughout the um, negotiations, there's been a sort of talk about the high seas being uh, uh, the Wild West with no regulations in place. But as you can see in the next slide, please. Um, but that's not entirely the picture. So I think that was a, a, a message that was deliberately existing, uh, ignoring the role of the existing bodies that are very active in regulation. And these are some of the regional bodies in, in the North Atlantic. And the next slide. And as we've already heard from many of the other speakers, it also ignored the existing global frameworks. But we do now have BBNJ, which, which adds another essential and important part of that uh, global structure and interaction of different uh, regulations. On to the next slide. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about what my party's uh, um, interests were in the agreement. And firstly, I have to say that my parties do have very different views uh, and different emphasis in the BBNJ. So with the European Union, Iceland, Norway, the Russian Federation and UK, all had different views and emphasis in the negotiations. One common element they did talk about, especially at the beginning of the discussions, was about the not undermining clauses. Um, and that's not about parties wanting to work in silos in the high seas, but it did express a view that um, where all relevant work organizations could work under the BBNJ, this would be under their and within their own expertise and their own competencies which we will see played out in the implementation of the BBNJ. Next slide, please. Um, and as others have said, um, obviously area-based management tools are a key element um, for us. And that covers not only MPAs, but the uh, other effective area-based conservation measures, which will be delivered by sectoral organizations. And the next slide. Um, Oh, sorry, can we go back up one, actually? Um, yeah, so one of those, one of the um, uh, elements that I, I'm, I would very briefly cover on that is that NIAFC has, since 2006, had conservation as part of its um, 
uh, its uh, agreement, part of the convention was, was updated to reflect that properly. And as such, we do have area-based measures for the protection of biodiversity, focusing on vulnerable marine ecosystems, so sponges and corals in the deep seas. And that effectively covers 98% of our regulatory area, the high seas, with um, protection against bottom fishing. And in fact, 7% of those uh, of that total area, the red marked areas, are completely close to bottom fishing. So if we can go to the next slide. And those measures are informed um, by independent holistic scientific advice. So again, that scientific element is very important for us as it is under the BBNJ. And the next slide. Um, and where we do have area-based management tools, we also like to work with other organizations such as OSPAR, who have high seas MPAs, and uh, Dominic will talk to us about that. But um, that's been through both an MOU and through something called the collective arrangement. And that's something where we meet every year and we talk in detail about the interaction between our NIAF measures and OSPAR's measures. And so, for instance, uh, currently we're talking about our measures on the seafloor and OSPAR's measures uh, in the water column. And we're all talking about ecosystem-based management. We're talking about bycatch. Um, and we're talking about how we can engage in the BBMJ process. So I think both of our organizations feel that regional bodies have expertise and perspectives that are unique. Um, and this will need to be built into the process of discussions under the BBNJ. Um, and actually the BBNJ also provides a, a useful framework for us to deepen our engagement in particular with, with global bodies such as the International Maritime Organization or the International Seabed Authority. So the next slide. Um, and one thing I just wanted to emphasize um, for regional fisheries management organizations and their role uh, under the BBMJ is that we do monitor and manage our activities in the high seas very closely through long established and very effective monitoring control and surveillance. And this does mean that we're well able to identify the human pressures and impacts from our activities. Um, and if areas are designated under the BBMJ with conservation objectives that may need a change in fisheries management, then we can effectively put them in practice and then enforce them. And my experience so far with high seas MPAs uh, development so far is often the biodiversity evidence is really, really strong. So you know what's going on in terms of the, uh, the birds or whatever, um, but actually the assessment of human activity and the impacts of that is often quite weak. Um, and that means that that can then lead to um, MPAs being established, but the programs of measures are not developed very quickly, and also the implementation is, is poor. So I think that's something that um, could be a temptation why uh, a lot of organizations want completely closed MPAs with no human activity because of that difficulty of articulating management. So I think, again, RFMOs can play a, a really important part in developing effective MPAs, but they must be consulted properly, and I'd say probably even more than consulted, that they'd be co-creators of those measures. So on to the next slide. The other uh, area of key, key interest in the BBNJ for NIAF contracting parties will also be the provisions on environmental impact assessments in the high seas. I don't think this will be something immediate for NIAF, but we already have in this very complicated slide, we have a whole series of um, uh, requirements where we want to start, if any um, country wanted to start bottom fishing in our restricted areas, they'd have to go through a pre-assessment and then exploratory fishing with very close monitoring over two years. Um, and in the light of the BBNJ, we might need to expand these environmental impact assessment requirements so as we cover other biodiversity uh, as opposed to just the vulnerable marine ecosystems. So that's something that we will be looking at. So if we look at the next slide, please. So that's really just highlighting the fact that there is still a lot of detail to be resolved, not just the ratification of the treaty, but also the processes, the structures, the practical Im implementation will all need to be worked out. And the next slide. And for us in NIAF, even as the ink is drying on the, on the conference a couple of weeks ago, our strategic committee within the AFC is looking at all aspects of the BBNJ to see how we can best engage with that positively. 
um, bringing forward our expertise in fisheries management, but also thinking of a broader ecosystem um, based approach um, consideration. So how do the decisions we make at sea actually affect um, not only the oceans, but also decisions made on land? And on to the next slide. And this is thinking about um, all the global frameworks we're in, but particularly thinking of the sustainable development goals, thinking about targets on food security and sustainable use. Um, our fisheries produce millions of tons of um, relatively low carbon, low impact human protein that ends up in countries such as Egypt and Nigeria. Uh, and every decision we make about production at sea, as the FAO has pointed out, also have impacts on food production on land with all the water and land use and carbon implications there. So I do hope that the BBNJ will enable decisions aiming to optimise the achievement of all these three pillars of sustainable developments, in, not just in our seas, but also in coastal and areas and also for our planet as a whole. And going on to my last slide. Um, just to go back to that mention that Giyun's had of the Sustainable Ocean Initiative, this has been a very effective engagement between regional fisheries bodies and regional fishery, uh, regional conservation bodies. Um, and I think we've been able to show that we can work on common objectives related to biodiversity protection, each within its own competence and expertise very effectively. So I hope the BBNJ will be an opportunity for more of that. And that takes me to my final slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Darius, for t talking us through as well as sharing your experience. And again, it might be different from other RFMOs, but I think it was great to see this experience and, and what you bring, but also um, talking about how to really kind of understanding and utilize, you know, complementary competencies, et cetera, and kind of the road ahead and what existing platforms exist for that exchange, but also your experience in kind of putting things into practice and for enforcement. And I know that there will be a lot of uh, details to be decided in terms of how it will work out in practice, but uh, I think for the willful collaboration is there. And um, thank you very much for sharing. Um, so we're now going to turn to um, our last speaker, Dominic Patterson. Uh, from OSPAR, from the OSPAR Convention. So we talked about regional fisheries management organization and their relation with BBNJ, but also the regional seas program. So, um, Dominic, are you online here? I will happily give you the I floor. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and thank you for, for inviting me uh, to this event. Um, I just wish I could be there with you in person. Um, I'm very conscious of the, the time that we, we have left, so I will try and get through um, the points that I wanted to make as, as quickly as, as possible. Um, just to, to recap, so yeah, I'm Dominic Pattinson, I'm the, the Executive Secretary at the OSPAR Convention. And just very briefly, for those that, that don't know about OSPAR, um, so we're the Regional Sea Convention uh, for the Northeast Atlantic. We have 15 uh, contracting parties, sort of from uh, Greenland, Iceland, all the way down to, to Portugal and the Azores. Um, and importantly, the, the, the European Union is, is one of our contracting parties as well. Um, the other point I would highlight at the outset is that uh, OSPAR, unlike uh, many regional sea conventions, uh, has a mandate to operate in the in areas beyond national jurisdiction. In fact, around 40% of our uh, the OSPAR maritime area is in is, is in ABNJ, which obviously is of relevance to the to the BBNJ agreement. Um, and we cover um, uh, everything from radioactive substances, oil and gas industry, all the way through to sort of uh, biodiversity, pollution, noise, litter all of those things and have lots of experience on the issues that I think Miss Lee was referring to under the CBD, uh, like uh, litter and, and marine litter, as I said. Um, and just a bit of context, so our contracting parties are still sort of discussing how the uh, how the BBNJ will sort of impact OSPAR's work. So, so what I'm going to say is a sort of bit of a mixture of what I uh, what I think they they think, um, um, but also some of my own views on on uh, what the BBNJ means for OSPAR's work. Um, it was very sort of pleasing to hear what I think is some really common themes coming through all of the presentations about the importance of collaboration and cooperation 
it's something that uh, is very much in line with how OSPAR works, that building consensus. We tend to try and get consensus on the measures that we, we want to sort of put forward because we think that that means they're more likely to be implemented. And I think, as I say, it was really pleasing to hear all the emphasis being put on collaboration and, and coordination in, in the earlier presentations and how uh, BBNJ um, will sort of provide a strong driver for improved uh, cross-sectorial sort of inter-regional cooperation and collaboration. And that, that's very much uh, in line with how uh, OSPAR is already working in the Northeast Atlantic. Um, uh, as Darius highlighted, um, uh, our sort of the OSPAR maritime area and the AFS area sort of overlap. Um, and for a number of years, we've been working together in this uh, collective arrangement. And I think it's worth reiterating uh, the points about, about this and sort of what it does, because uh, I think for us, we see it as a very good example of how you can have the, the, uh, the sort of the cooperation coordination that everyone's been talking about at a regional level um, and provides a sort of a, a platform, if you want, uh, for for that kind of uh, to facilitate cooperation and coordination on area-based management uh, tools, um, but as well as sharing information on uh, lots of the issues that Darius mentioned in his presentation between the sort of competent authorities. Um, uh, uh, and going forward, and and we had um, there was a bit of a pause due to COVID. Um, but we had our latest uh, collective arrangement meeting uh, only a few weeks ago in June. Um, and I think it was it was very well attended, um, not only by the contracting parties from OSPAR and NEAF, but also other competent bodies such as the ISA, ICAT, uh, ICs and UNIT. And I think the reason that I wanted to, to reiterate this was I already felt that um, the BBNJ sort of has, has given sort of added impetus to, to the work of the collective arrangement. There was a real sense uh, in the room that the, the contracting parties, the organisations that were present, really saw uh, uh, an interest in sort of seeing how we could use and develop the collective arrangement as a way of um, using it as a regional platform for this co collaboration and cooperation that that is needed if we're going to sort of effectively implement the BBNJ agreement in the Northeast Atlantic region. Um, the next the next point I wanted to, to highlight in relation to OSPAR's work is, again, as, as, as Darius mentioned, he's, he's showing his uh, experience of having been in my role a few years ago, um, is our work on uh, um, MPAs. So it's a key feature of OSPAR's work is our MPAs in, in ABNJ. Um, the first ones of those were established as far back as, as uh, two, uh, 2010. Um, and to date, we've collectively uh, designated eight MPAs in areas beyond national jurisdiction, covering over a million square kilometers uh, in the in the OSPAR maritime area. Uh, the most recent of those was the, uh, um, and it's our largest, uh, roughly the size of France, is the the North Atlantic Current and Evolutnov Sea Basin MPA, which is out in the in the middle of the Atlantic, um, and originally was was focused on protecting uh, sort of foraging areas for for seabirds, um, and uh, but at our commission meeting last week, so we had our annual commission meeting last week, um, we've managed to uh, extend the protection of that so that it now covers deep sea ecosystems, including sort of additional species and habitats such as coral gardens and deep sea sharks, and importantly, the seabed. Um, so I think the, the point that I'm trying to highlight is that OSPAR uh, has been doing uh, stuff in areas beyond national jurisdiction on MPAs for a long time. And one of the issues that I um, picked up during the negotiations on the BBNJ was there seemed to be uh, a bit of a reluctance uh, to sort of include something on recognizing existing MPAs um, uh, going forward. And I kind of, I understand it. I understand that, you know, people outside of the Northeast Atlantic might feel uncomfortable just rubber stamping decisions that have been taken by, by other parties. But I just hope that going forward, that we find a way to um, not, not just rubber stamp them, but at least a way of fast tracking those existing MPAs that are out there. I think it was Aurore who mentioned the processes in the uh, in the BBNJ for um, 
uh, establishing MPAs. Uh, and we've we've gone through a lot of those processes already. So we've we've established the scientific base. We've done the consultation with the interested parties. So uh, it would be a shame, given the the crises that we've got uh, on biodiversity, that we can't agree to sort of have those MPAs agreed at a global level. Um, uh, I think the, the the challenge we've got, and again, it was alluded to by Darius, is that. Um, our mandate in OSPAR is limited, so we need to work with other com competent bodies, IMO, MEAFC, uh, ICAT, on putting in place the necessary measures to protect uh, the features and habitats that we want to see protected uh, in those MPAs. Uh, just very briefly, um, we're also looking at EIAs and SEAs in OSPAR, um, and I think we see that as our contracting parties are keen to sort of build on whatever comes out of the BBNJ uh, processes, but OSPAR might want to uh, have uh, uh, or lead by example and set more stringent uh, standards in that space, but that's uh, work that's in, de in development. And then very, very finally, um, I think just in relation to the CBD's global biodiversity framework, I think Clearly, our work on uh, MPAs in areas beyond national jurisdiction would be how we see OSPAR contributing uh, to the achievement of the Global Biodiversity Framework, in particular Target 3. Um, but there's lots of other stuff that OSPAR is also doing um, that will contribute uh, as well to the GBF. So I think just overall, I think uh, OSPAR very much welcomed the agreement of the BBNJ. Um, uh, I love the expression soirée pyjama. Um, it didn't feel like that at the time, uh, but uh, yeah, uh, it was really great to be there. And, and as others have said, a historic moment. Um, and I think it, it fits nicely with what OSPAR has been trying to do in its uh, maritime area. So we would like to sort of uh, see it as a driver for uh, greater, uh, closer collaboration. And as I said, I think we've already started to see the benefits of that in our in our collective arrangement meeting. And I hope that that leads to better and quicker uh, protection of the marine environment, which I think we all agree is is needed. So I'll, I'll stop there and uh, hopefully there's still some time left for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dominic, for, for sharing OSPAR's convention and all the work that you do. Uh, and for together with Kamala being uh, the pioneers of, you know, high seas uh, MPAs and very much a c congratulations to you for the extension, or I should say congratulations to all of us, right, um, for protecting uh, coral reefs also in the high seas, but also important shark uh, and race areas. So congratulations. Um, and I think what I've also heard throughout uh, today is really that kind of words like co-creation, co-design, and really the strong basis for collaboration. And as you said, sometimes when you have um, multilateral, you know, agreements or that at the consensus level, sometimes it doesn't mean that the bar stop there. You can always go beyond and be more ambitious. So I really like to hear when I heard that you said that OSPAR liked to lead by example or leading by example and the focus on going forward from where we are today, um, we have strong ambitions to have, you know, more MPAs established on the high seas, to have modern environmental impacts assessment conducted, uh, as we heard, as well as the kind of needs and for, you know, equity in all forms of implementation. I think going forward, it's we really need to think about number one is really to bring this treaty into force. We need to have at least 60 uh, states ratifying it. And it doesn't need to take 12 years like with UNCLOS. Uh, it can be done faster. It has done been done before. Um, but in order to get the states to ratify, I think it is really important that part of the capacity building, not only what are the next steps and what you need to do, but also to think about the awareness raising of the benefits. I think agreeing on the text is one thing, but that might still be misconstrued, misconception. What does it really mean and uncertainties? And I think that's really important to, to work together to, to work this out. And of course, building those uh, institutions and frameworks, and that needs to be done in parallel and the capacity building both for science and technology. So once again, uh, there's been such uh, a pleasure. Uh, we are uh, officially over time, but um, MEP Meshabu has said that she will be able to stay a few more minutes. And I would like to give the opportunity to the audience 
um, to pose a few questions um, and then we'll have some closing remarks from MEP. So I will now open the floor to, to anyone here, firstly in the room, uh, who would like to ask a question. Please say, state your name and where you're from and who you are addressing the question to. Thank you very much. The floor is open. That's the prerogative of, of the chair. I also have quite a question. I'll let you go first. Uh, thank you very much, um, MP Christine. You're really... uh, yeah, I will have uh, questions to, to Aurore, but not on, on only Aurore. You, you don't really answer uh, about China. And uh, I think we, it's interesting to, to understand how the negotiations uh, move forward to an adoption uh, and there there are special states that we have to yeah manage <laughs> so how it works and uh, you didn't speak about the member states in EU but I would like to to understand because here in the parliament I'm trying to to make all ocean issues more visible and uh, to make all member states aware that uh, they are all concerned by ocean issues, not only uh, Portugal, France, or Ireland, etc., but all of them. So that that will be a question for her. And I would like, uh, I don't know who should answer, but what is a sustainable use on the of the ocean? I'm, you were speaking all about the ocean, sustainable use, but what is the sustainable use? Yes, please. So thank you. It's true that I owe you an answer on China. At the same time, uh, uh, you know, I represent the EU, so I, I cannot really speak about China's position. What I can say is that uh, um, we have noticed that China was relatively unhappy at the, in the previous negotiation rounds about the direction that the negotiations were, were taken. And, um, but they, come, they came to the table. Uh, they came to the table. I think they have uh, um, um, what I heard from from China is that they wanted to be on board. They wanted to be on board the treaty and they wanted to be um, um, a party. And I, I understand that they do want to become a party. And, and for us, this is obviously um, excellent news because uh, China is such a major um, ocean power nowadays that we need them on board this conservation agenda for it to to, to make sense. So uh, we are very happy about uh, we are very happy about uh, this. Um, on sustainable use, I think we probably need a few other intergroup events in order to answer that question because uh, it is all a matter of uh, 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 lengthy discussions and interpretations uh, about where exactly uh, the border is and and what what can we do and what can we not do. So I don't think unfortunately i'm able to um, answer it very very simply now at that stage but surely that will be also at the heart of the discussions we will be having in the in the bbnj so yeah absolutely member states are absolutely on board the agenda i mean this is this is a, what we call a mixed agreement in the eu lingo so that means that uh, uh, we have been working very closely with uh, with the member states in developing the EU position and in the negotiations. Um, all the EU member states are part of the high ambition coalition on BBNJ, whether landlocked or not. I think everybody understands that uh, uh, the benefits of a healthy ocean span way beyond the uh, coastal states, and uh, and uh, so therefore I think we have a, quite a very we had a very strong and uh, united uh, EU. Uh, behind that agenda and, and also behind the, the implementation agenda, um, I believe. Okay, thank you very much for elaborating. So, um, final opportunity. I do have a gavel here, which I've been dying to use to go one, two, three. Uh, okay, we have one more, one question at the back. Please state where you're from and who you're addressing the question to. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity to ask a question. My name is Siegfried Schmuck. I'm working with Pew Charitable Trusts. And um, I would like to thank everybody on the panel for these uh, excellent presentations and for uh, elaborating more on, uh, on the way forward. Uh, my question would be for uh, Aurore from uh, Tichimare. Uh, good to see you again. Uh, thank you for all your work uh, at, uh, at the negotiation rounds. Uh, 
now that uh, the treaty uh, has been uh, signed uh, in uh, last week, I think it was more or less two weeks ago, uh, what, is, what is the timetable or the time schedule you foresee uh, in the EU uh, for the ratification process? Uh, if you could say a few words on that. Thank you. Yes, thank you. So indeed, the treaty was adopted on the 19th of June. It will open for signature on the 20th of September. We very much hope that the EU will be able to be there to sign. We have just uh, from the Commission side made a proposal for what's called a proposal for a signature decision to the Council, uh, which will be discussed in, in uh, Council tomorrow. So that just uh, not even two weeks after the treaty was adopted. So that's very, very uh, speedy. Uh, and so um, the same on ratification, we intend to do it as soon as possible. So uh, we are working within the Commission very speedily to be able to propose a decision for ratification. And then how long it will take will depend on, uh, on uh, how long the Council will take uh, to uh, examine and adopt that decision. And then the ball will go to the European Parliament, which will have to give its consent. Uh, and so uh, I think at that stage, uh, the, the, the timing uh, of the EU ratification is a bit outside of the Commission's control, but of course I think the intention from everybody, all institutions uh, included, is, is, uh, is so that the EU can be on board as, as soon as possible. Thank you very much. So thank you for the question as well for the answer. Uh, we have one more question in the back and one online and there we draw the line um, as we know we have to get on to other commitments. So please, the gentleman in the back and if you can state your name and where you're from. Thanks. Yes, <clears throat> sorry. Uh, my name is Paul. I work for the European Association of Fish Producer Organizations and I had maybe two questions. The first one was related to um, the... Um, maybe like so the, who's stronger between BBNJ and uh, the global diversity framework in terms of uh, legislative value? I mean, is uh, the global diversity framework superseding the BBNJ? Is, that's kind of something I'm not sure I understood in, uh, in today's presentation. And my second question is regarding the implementation of this agreement. Um, once it's ratified by the council, will the, because we, we can see that some of the targets are kind of already included in European legislation. Um, so will that give um, new legislation, new legislative proposals from the, uh, from the Commission afterwards or just the next steps regarding the implementation? Thank you very much. Thank, thank you very much. And I do hope it doesn't come to arm wrestling in the sense of who is stronger. Uh, I think it's a very important question and it's something that has been echoed repeatedly, which is not to, to undermine, but what it means in practice, we talk about collaboration. I think um, I might uh, pass this question on to Ms. Jihun Lee, uh, because of your experience, both working with the ISA and CBD, and how you, how, what is your take on this? Thank you. Uh, it's a very interesting question, uh, who is stronger? <laughs> uh, but I think maybe what you're trying to say is how we can really uh, work together uh, among between different framework uh, and then create synergies because uh, uh, obviously a GBF under Convention on Biological Diversity is relying on national level implementation while the, the BBNJ agreement is uh, focusing on ABNJ and then there is a very specific role for intergovernmental uh, competent organization like IMO, ISA, or, you know, many regional fisheries bodies. But then uh, I want to just remind you that the GBF uh, decision, COP15 decision also is uh, inviting uh, relevant competent organization and their governing bodies to endorse GBF so that they can use it as a framework for for biodiversity goals and targets within through their governing process. So I think there is a clear relationship that we can build. And of course, all, all uh, this is all in the hands of parties and their member states and their governing bodies. But then I think that we should really, we cannot waste our time for synergies and it's not that we have to measure legally which is uh, which goes first. Uh, maybe that's not really the, the focus. The focus is really how we can effectively uh, support each other and create synergies. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. And I know that the, um, uh, Ms. Chabot needs to leave the room very shortly. There was one question online really addressing uh, what is sustainable use. Um, and I have um, Manuel Barange on the line who would like to answer that question. Thank you. Yes, Mina, thank you so much. I just wanted to respond to, to um, Ms. Chabot's um, comment that, in fact, when it comes to fisheries, um, and that is not all the resources, the fisheries targeted resources, the term sustainability is very well defined and it's defined in Agenda 2030, it's defined in UNCLOS, it's defined in many other instruments as meaning uh, exploiting populations to the level, not, ex not ex exceeding the level that produces maximum sustainable yield. That is the, 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 the formal definition. But more importantly, in BPNJ, there is a definition of uh, sustainable use, actually, in, in, in Article 1, um, sub, sub, uh, um, sub Article 13, which means ensuring that biodiversity does not decline and therefore that maintains its potential to meet needs and aspirations of present and future generations. So the definitions are very clear. Um, what one is to do is implement those definitions, and one might have different views on how strong these definitions are, but they are defined for a reason, and I think that that obligation in international organisations is to implement them according to that definition. Thank you. Thank you very, very much. So uh, with that, we have uh, concluded the, the Q&A session and this very interesting panel. And I would really sincerely like to, uh, before giving the final, final word to uh, Ms. Shabu, really to say uh, thank you to the intergroup um, and also for, you know, yourself and your engagement uh, for bringing us together and also full disclosure. I'm also here because of Despina sitting on the front row. Um, but really to all the participants and for your engagement. We know it really needs to move forward and really implement this and, and you know, and all the enabling institutions and mechanisms, all the enabling conditions to make it entry into force early and for fast tracking the implementation. And of course, IUCN stands ready as a global organization with this member state. We will call on all our member states to, to ratify uh, this treaty. So thanks a lot to everyone. Uh, but also, again, it's been a very long journey. So everyone who's been involved and including civil society. So on that very final note, and again, thank you to all the panelists and speakers for, for being here with us, both in, in person and online. So final, final word to you, uh, Ms. Chabot. And once again, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mina. And I would like everybody to applaud, to, to, to give a big applaud to, to you, Mina, because you, it was uh, really an honor and uh, a good moderation. Thank you very much to you. And, as a conclusion, I would like to highlight one thing. Uh, you know, here in the parliament, I'm trying to, I'm a supporter of the SDGs and uh, the integrity approach of the SDGs. And I, when I'm listening to all the speakers, uh, once again, I realize that with the UNCLOSE, we, we finally, we, we cut the ocean in pieces. And after all, we, we created all those bodies uh, under the UN uh, and uh, regional or um, uh, sectorial bodies. And now we are trying to find the way to put the pieces together. <laughs> and I think, uh, and uh, I'm very optimistic for, for but, but it will be a, a hard work because I'm optimistic because I, I feel the willing, we, willingness of everybody. We, 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 we really want to cooperate. Cooperation, as you mentioned, Mina, is the word. Uh, and, but I think we, we should more invest in the SDGs, as uh, Mr. Campbell, I think, uh, was speaking of, uh, of the SDGs, because I think it's a universal tool that we, we, we should use more. And I think it will help to bring uh, all, uh, all actors uh, on board, even because we, we don't speak about uh, enough about the seabed authority. We, we actually, we, we have a very important negotiation on, uh, on sea, uh, sea, uh, deep sea mining. And I think for me, of course, there, there is, we, we should have organized an event on the BBNG and, uh, and the Seabed Authority negotiation. Uh, yeah, there's a lot of things to, 
to, to, to tell about that. But so I think we really need to think how uh, we could uh, more uh, have better international ocean governance. And I will. I was speaking yesterday with the general secretary of the IMO and uh, asking him the, the same question because IMO is working on uh, biodiversity protection as well. And do they work enough with the others or the other bodies under UN? Uh, um, for under the UN, I don't know. And he, he told me that, of course, they need to be uh, closer uh, to the other, uh, to, to the BBNG negotiations, to the UNEP, to, to the FAO, et cetera, et cetera. And um, finally, it will help to, uh, we, I think we all think that ocean will uh, save multilateralism and will save probably the peace. So I think we, we I, I know that we have a lot to do to, yeah, to, to the ratifications and 2025 will be, I think, a, a milestone for, for everybody. And we, we, we will need, I know that France, we will work with the others, with the EU and with uh, all of you to, to have this, I hope, uh, this ratification uh, uh, by, by 2025 by, by Nice, I, ho I will hope. You know, during this event, uh, there was a, a, a new uh, a conference to um, a session uh, organized by France on the organization of this event uh, of... Uh, the, the UN Con Ocean Conference in 2025. So thank you to everybody. And uh, you can, we, we will be on the deck with the parliament as well. Uh, and uh, thank you. Bon vent to everybody. <laughs>